for astrophysics. I know anyone here from UM has seen parts of what I'm going to talk about now. I, I go into a little more detail on it. Um, and, and, you know, teaching the 330 class, the physics communication class or scientific communication class at UM, I always tell students not to do an outline, but I decided to do a pictorial outline for mine. And that's because like so many science endeavors, my science, and I don't know why it's not responding. There we go. So my science starts with confused astronomers and so much of physics starts with confused astronomers. So we're gonna go through why the astronomers are confused and what they need from us as physicists. And what they need from us is these photoionization measurements. And I'm gonna talk about what it is that I actually do and where I do it, which is at the Advanced Light Source at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Now that's where I have been doing it, but that's not necessarily where it's going to continue being done because we're branching out a bit, which is really exciting. And part of that branching out is going to be the last part of the talk, which is talking about the new M5 apparatus that was just funded with a $1.5 million NSF grant just a few months ago. So really the outline of this is why we do the science that we're doing, what science are we doing, where we do that science, and then how we do that science. And those are the four categories I'm going to go in that order. Um, so Again, anyone who's seen me in freshman physics experience has seen this at UM, but for those who haven't, it's really exciting being an AMO physicist in Montana because everyone thinks you do AMO research. I get you know, sort of some street cred here in Montana when I say I'm an AMO physicist, but of course it has nothing to do with uh, Julie's angry cat there shooting its gun. I'm an atomic, molecular, and optical physicist, and that's an entire subdivision of the APS, the American Physical Society. And so it turns out it's the oldest and the largest subdivision of APS. And the reason it's the oldest and the largest I'm going to go into in a minute, but really it deals with atoms, molecules, and using light to study nature. So you can imagine if it deals with atoms, it deals with molecules and we're using light, it should be a pretty big subdivision of the American Physical Society since that covers so much of what physicists do. So I wanna do a little history lesson about where the AMO uh, branch of the APS came from. Really, it founded the APS. So it really started in the, uh, the 19th century, right around 1800, so the turn of the 19th century. And again, I don't know why this thing isn't responding. There we go. So AMO plus astro is what I'm gonna talk about here. So neither of these things really existed. Yeah, there was observational astronomy, there was, there was Galileo, there was uh, Copernicus, there was Kepler, but this sort of symbiotic relationship between the two didn't exist till Joseph Fraunhofer came along. And really what he was, was an expert glasssmith. And all he did was develop these techniques to make crown glass really purely. So it was free of bubbles and free of density variations. And in being able to do so, he was able to make really nice lenses and prisms. So he was a craftsman more than a scientist, even though they say, you know, he was a Bavarian scientist that really came out of the fact that he was a craftsman. So he made these prisms. And one of the first things he did was he took a source of white light and he shined that white light through the prism. And if you shine white light through a prism, of course, you get that continuous spectrum in the visible spectrum. Now that's an emission spectrum. We have a source of white light. It's putting off photons. Those photons are refracting through his prism. He gets this really nice spectrum. One of the first things he did after that was he went to his kiln and he put the prism in front of the fire that fired his kiln. And instead of getting a continuous spectrum from that fire, he got something that was a discrete emission spectrum. He saw these bright lines and then nothing, and then a bright line and then nothing. Now realize this is before people really understood what was going on here. He particularly saw a really bright orange line there. Now we know now that most of the spectrum from fire is actually in the infrared, but there is some visible lines. Of course we can see it, right? So he wanted to know more about it and he thought, well, there's this huge ball of fire in the sky. I will point my prism at that thing and see if I get that same bright orange emission band from the sun. And he got something very different when he looked at the sun. So once he put the sun in the thing, instead of these, these emission lines, he saw a spectrum with dark lines. So now what we're seeing is the same thing he saw in his lab, but we're seeing sort of the time reversal of it. Instead of something acting as a source of light, which the sun clearly is a source of light, but now those lines, the sun emits continuously across the visible spectrum that we see. Now we're seeing absorption bands. And he realized those absorption bands had something to do with what the sun was made of. 
So those absorption bands were things that were getting in the way of the photons escaping the sun. They were being absorbed preferentially in these discrete lines. And those discrete lines are just like the emission bands, but in time reversal. Instead of emitting a photon, you're capturing one, and the same atomic process leads to either. So he knew, okay, I need to go into the lab and I need to study this. So he went into the lab and he invented what was called Fraunhofer spectroscope, which is really the first spectrometer. And it's got a little eyepiece and it's got a couple of branches where you can burn various elements in the lab. And then you can look at the spectra of those elements. There's a nice famous picture of him showing some colleagues at the time and actually a drawing that he did. This is a drawing by Fraunhofer from, I forget what it was. I think it says, I don't know, 1815 or so. The drawing shows his spectrum from the sun and he sees those dark emission bands. So really he started burning things in the lab to try to figure out what those dark emission bands were. And you can see in the lab, he's burning them. He sees their emission bands here. They lines them up with their absorption bands. And he was able to figure out what the sun is made out of by measuring these things in the lab. That's exactly what I do. That's exactly what so many laboratory astrophysicists do now is we go into the lab and we measure things and we measure things in support of observations made by astronomers where they're looking and they're saying, we just don't understand what we're seeing. We need you to sort of be the Rosetta Stone, the translator. You need to go in and tell us the fundamental physics of what's going on up there so that we can use that to analyze what we are seeing in our spectra. So even now, if we go to like something like Fraunhofer or the Hubble, which is sort of bridging past and present, Keck Observatory in Hawaii is still present, but there's all of these future things going up. The James Webb Space Telescope is a big one. The 30 meter telescope, the European Space Agency's foremost apparatus. These are all just about to be released. And there's already just a flood of backlogged data that the astronomers need from us. Now those instruments are just gonna make it much worse. So there's always this sort of like arms race. The astronomers are getting better and better and better observational tools. So us in the laboratory astrophysics community have to develop better better and better and better experimental tools to keep up with what they need. And I've been doing this work in multiple places. I did my dissertation work at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab at the Advanced Light Source, which I'll talk about in detail. I was at the Joint Institute of Laboratory Astrophysics at the University of Colorado for my postdoc. That has really become, it's not really that name anymore. They still call it JILA. We all say it's JILA, but it's really an M research headquarters now. One of the, I think, it and MIT are considered the two uh, AMO centers on the planet. So it's really an AMO physics place, which makes sense because they were doing laboratory astrophysics, which is sort of by nature AMO physics, and even at the University of Montana here in the lab and with students at the ALS. So let's start with, this is sort of an introduction, let's start with that whole idea of why we do the science. So let's look at those astronomers, those little pack of confused astronomers. So the why we do what we do. So here's our periodic table. And up in the right, there's this plot. And this plot, let me explain this to you. It's the atomic mass of all the elements, known elements in the universe, and their abundances. Now notice these abundances are all related to silicon. So these are all normalized to silicon, and these are all in a log scale. So we have this thing that's got a log scale. Now everything that's produced by fusion in active stars and the cores of stars are black dots. Everything on the left of this. Everything to the right is produced by something called neutron capture. In neutron capture, what happens is a nucleus just kind of swallows a neutron. And then through a gamma decay, a beta decay, and a gamma decay, that neutron becomes a proton. And you've become one element heavier. And that's how you become one element heavier by neutron capture. A neutron just becomes a proton. Fusion, you take two nuclei, you fuse them together, you get heavier faster. Now, if you look at these abundances, for what are seen around the universe. We see things over here. The majority of these fusion elements are up here in the millions. Again, this is a relative scale. They're in the millions. If we come over here to the slow process, now the slow process is a neutron capture process that happens over a, a, an order of decades. It takes a while for this to really build up inside of stars. It's happening in stars actively. But if you look at the average of these blue ones, let's say it's right about here, the average of the blue ones is like one element of whatever this is compared to a million of whatever this is in a star. Even if we go up to the high ones here in neutron capture, we're up in the hundreds compared to the millions. So what happens is when you look at a star, you see these spectra. Those spectra are entirely fusion elements. So all you are seeing there 
are the absorption bands up to iron, really. Now, it goes a little higher than iron, but not much. So that's what you're seeing, which means historically, for the last going on 220 years since Fraunhofer developed his spectrograph, people have been studying things up to iron, just studying them to death, and then not studying anything else because no one's asking for it. I mean, we have elements up here that are used in silicon for uh, doped semiconductors that are all over the world, and yet we still don't really understand their their energy levels or their atomic structure very well because an astronomer hasn't seen them. It's sort of amazing that way, but that's what happens, which means all of that is basically just not known to humanity. And people are always surprised by that. When I was starting graduate school, a friend of mine who's a detective now in the California Highway Patrol, educated guy said, why would you study physics? We already know everything. Now, I think that's sort of a common mentality about people or with people with physics is that we know everything. Just look at the periodic table. Those things in red, we know very little about. We, you go into NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and you look for the energy levels for these various elements. You wanna see, oh, the electrons are at these various levels. You think, of course we know all that. And it's just a blank page after blank page after blank page for these heavier elements because they haven't been observed before. But just recently in the last 15 years or so, which for me is recent, for you guys, that's like two thirds of your life ago. But for me, that was like last week they have been detected in something called planetary nebula. Come on. Don't know why that's being so slow. So planetary nebula, let's look at what a planetary nebula is. So a planetary nebula, you can see it's the depth of a medium mass star, sort of like our star about one to eight solar masses. Now that's not massive enough to end up going into a supernova. So what ends up happening is once the hydrogen in the core is exhausted, that hydrogen was pushing out against gravity as it was fusing into helium. Once that hydrogen is exhausted, that outward pressure dies and the star starts to collapse. And then it heats up, heats up, heats up, and then it just kind of blows off all of its material into space and then it collapses again. And it keeps going through this breathing cycle that you can see in that video. And it just keeps throwing everything it's ever made in its lifetime off into space. And then what's left at the center of this thing is a white dwarf. And that white dwarf is glowing in the UV to X-ray and it's lighting up that entire cloud of everything that it made. Now this is called a planetary nebula, because early astronomers thought they looked like the outer planets with their junky telescopes. They would look up there and they would see Neptune and they'd see one of these things and they thought they were the same thing. But really this is a dead star. So it's really interesting that these things make everything they're gonna make in their lifetime, throw it off into space and then light it up for the rest of the universe to, to see. It's sort of like someone putting all of their, everything they made in the front window on display. This is what we have made in this star. And it's just in the last few years that we've been able to really see beyond iron and it's in planetary nebula where the fusion process has stopped. So all of those light elements are not just swamping the spectra and everything's been diffused out. And now we can tease out the emission lines and the absorption lines of heavier elements. So the person that I met who does this is Nick Sterling. He's at the University of West Georgia. That's Nick there doing about everything an astronomer does at the ALS, which is sit there and cheer us on and read. Um, he did the work that actually turned out to be my dissertation. He invited me to come along to support his observations and he was looking at planetary nebula. And you can see we have emission lines of bromine, krypton and selenium. Those are just not seen in active stars. So he was the first one to measure those. So he needed me to go into the lab and do what Fraunhofer did, which is find those, those lines. And what he does is he uses that information to figure out how much of each of those elements are being synthesized in stars, which tells you about the chemical evol evolution of the universe. But those amounts, those elemental abundances that he calculates can be really terribly inaccurate just because the data is so terrible. So his community desperately needs the atomic data that we provide. Just as an example, so my dissertation thesis was five elements of selenium, and we've got, I think, seven papers out of that. And two of the papers were selenium three plus and selenium five plus. When I wrote those papers, even though I'm in the field, I was shocked that when I went to NIST, of the 42 references they have in NIST for the data they know about those two, all but one was theoretical, which means it was sort of a calculating guesstimate. And, and scientists even right now today with supercomputers and relativistic corrections have trouble modeling these systems because they're so complex. So this is back, you know, these were studies in the 70s. 
the only experiment that was ever done was done in 1923. So that's all the data Nick had to go on. That's how little we have for astronomers to use. So that's one of the projects I'm doing, this whole modeling of the interactions of planetary nebula. Another one is active galactic nuclei. This is a new one with the new product. So what active galactic nuclei is, it's this incredibly bright thing at the center of active galaxies. And they're called active because they have an AGN, an active galactic nucleus. And that thing is the brightest continuously illuminating object in the universe, an AGN. And in fact, they were originally thought to be just really bright stars. So scientists called them quasi stars because they didn't know what they were because they were so bright, which is where quasar came from. This is a quasar, a quasi star. It's not really a star. The thing about them is they're so bright, which means you can see them from really far away. And when I say really far away, I'm talking like across the universe. So you can see them all the way out at the edge of the universe. Now, if you're looking that far, that means you're looking back in time. So if you're looking at active galactic nuclei, you look at 10, 12 billion years ago. So you can use them as this amazing barometer of how the universe has evolved. But again, the information that you're going to get out of those is going to be based on how well you understand the structure that you are receiving. So one of the primary goals of that recently funded apparatus was to study active galactic nuclei. And here is a direct quote I just cut and pasted from my uh, recent proposal. And there's a whole lot in there, and I'll just summarize it for you. The astronomers are saying, we'd like to understand AGNs. The theory is problematic, we'll put it that way. And the experiments don't exist, so please help us. That's what funded this $1.5 million project is these ideas, how desperate they are. These are those collaborators that I'm working with. Maurice Leitniger is actually one of the PIs, co-PIs on my project. So we're doing active galactic nuclei. He and I are also studying interstellar medium, which is another one of the projects we're gonna be using X-rays to study matter. And we're gonna see how we do that in a minute. There are other astronomers out there who've jumped on board. Tim Kalman jumped on board from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, more interstellar medium stuff. One I'm really excited about is Andre Gribizik's work. He was a postdoc with me at JILA, and I would sneak over to his lab and I would help him with his research. He was doing more like chemical analysis or physical chemistry in David Nesbitt's group. And what he's studying is the origins of life in the universe. And the way he's studying it is he's looking at the progenitor species, these little tiny organic molecules that are in the atmosphere out in Titan because it's believed that Titan is sort of like early Earth, and he's trying to understand how life formed on the early Earth. So he had this great idea of how to study that using the merged beams end stations. So that's another project happening here. Again, all of this work in support of astronomers who are doing observational studies, and they need help understanding the science because they need atomic physics. So now I'm gonna go into the, the what we do, and what we do is photoionization. So a real a quick primer, reminder for some of you, review for some of you, a primer for some of you. So the idea here is an ion is an atom or a molecule that has a net electric charge, which just means the number of protons does not equal the number of electrons. So somehow we have an imbalance there. Most of the matter in the universe is a plasma, which is just a soup of ions. It's ions, it's free electrons, it's those positive cores that are left. So it's obviously something that's very important to study. So we study it by doing photoionization. Now, what that means is we're going to remove electrons to produce an ion. You can also add electrons to produce a negative ion, but that's much more rare. It's much easier to just rip electrons off of an atom. I've had some people ask, well, what if you add a proton? That produces an ion, right? No, that produces a different element. You've changed the nucleus at that point. So at this point, what we're talking about is just adding or removing electrons what I do is remove electrons. It's much easier. Now, there are certain processes when you do that with photons that make for really accurate studies of the atomic structure of these elements. So we find, and specifically, and this is going to sound redundant, redundant, we do photoionization of ions, which seems like, well, what are you talking about? You're photoionizing an ion? Yes, we start with positive ions, ones that are missing electrons already. So why do we start with positive ions? Because most of the universe, when you see ions, are positive ions. Most of these things in active galactic nuclei and, and all of these interstellar media, the things we see in planetary nebula, that's positive ions that we're seeing. So that's why we're studying them. So why do we start with ions? Well, most of what we're seeing is already in the plasma state. Those 
those nebula are already in the plasma state and then they're being bombarded by that white dwarf at the core. So really what's happening up there is you have ions and then they're getting either further ionized or capturing free electrons and emitting photons, one or the other, but they're already ions. So we're just modeling exactly what exists in the astrophysical object. We're starting with ions, then we're going to photo ionize them with photons. Another thing about starting with ions, which is really nice, is you can manipulate them. They're easy to grab onto because they have a charge. Neutrals are a pain. They just kind of wander through the lab and you can't stop them. You have to use something like the Stark effect, like I used at Jilla, and it was, no thanks, I'd rather have a charged species. So Photoionization, a quick review of what that means. So here we have sort of a classical cartoonish representation of an atom, and I have my photon there to the left. That photon has enough energy to eject one of these outer electrons. In other words, it can get this outer electron to have enough energy to overcome, in a classical sense, the Coulomb attraction of the nucleus. So I have that photon go on. I just kicked out an electron. That is photoionization. I have ionized this atom with a photon. Photoionization. Here's what the spectra look like when we collect them. On the horizontal axis, we have photon energy. This is a very typical energy range for some of the nebular work we do. On the vertical axis, we have photoionization cross-section, which is really just we're counting the number of ions that we're producing with photons. So in this case, we started with rubidium 2 plus. Remember, we start with ions. We're going to hit them with photons and then turn them into higher charge states by ripping electrons off. Here, we're just counting how many of those ions we produce that have lost one additional electron. So they went from rubidium 2 plus a photon. They became rubidium 3 plus a free electron that just leaves the apparatus. So here, that direct ionization we saw where an electron just got kicked out, it's not very interesting. It's this thing. It's the stuff down here in the bottom. At the lab, we call it down in the grass. It's just the noise. Here, there weren't photoions being produced directly, and then all of a sudden, there were photoions being produced directly. That's not interesting. What's interesting to the astronomers, what's interesting to us as scientists, is that resonance structure, because each of these lines that you see represents one of these fingerprint lines that you see in the spectra. So that's what we're gonna study. That's indirect photoionization. So same situation, same photon, it has the same energy. It's got enough energy to kick out this outer electron, but it does not have enough energy to kick out an inner electron. It can only excite an inner electron. So if that photon misses an outer electron and hits a core electron, it just excites it. It can't leave because the photon didn't have enough energy. So what that looks like, so we have this atom, my photon's gonna come in, it's gonna miss the valence electron, hit a core electron and excite it. And that core electron is now in this quasi-bound excited state. Now that thing can do a few things to relax because nature likes to be lazy. That thing is going to relax. So what it's going to do is that it can either just re-emit that same photon and fall back in the hole that it left in the core, or it can do something much more interesting. It can exchange its energy with that loose valence electron instead. And that loose valence electron can be kicked out with that energy. So really that excited electron kicks out a valence electron as it relaxes. And that's called an Auger electron. That's been sort of kicked out on its own, which is why it's called auto ionization. The photon didn't ionize the atom. The photon just excited it. The atom ionized itself when it relaxed. So that's resonant auto ionization. Now the reason it's resonant, the reason it makes those big spikes in our graph is because atoms have to follow the rules of quantum mechanics. There are selection rules. And the one that really makes the biggest difference here in just understanding this process is this idea that atoms, like a hotel with floors, have discrete energy levels. You know, except for being John Malkovich, you can't make it to the seven and a half floor, or the ninth and a quarter floor of a hotel. It's eight, nine, 10, et cetera. An atom is the exact same way, which means when an electron gets excited, it has to make those discrete jumps. And those jumps have to exactly match the photon energy that was absorbed. There's no place to get rid of that energy. There's no place to get rid of kinetic energy. You can't get rid of anything. It needs to exactly match that jump. So what that produces in our spectrum are these spikes. And what's happening here is we have that direct photoionization cross-section of the background. We are constantly bombarding steel, in this case, selenium plus with photons. And we're changing the energy of the photons. And then all of a sudden we get to one of those places where a core electron can make a jump, where that energy difference is just right. Here it looks like it's about 21.215 EV. Suddenly that must be an energy difference in that atom. 
and it can make that jump and auto ionize and we get millions, literally, we get megahertz of signal, millions of these photo ions that are selenium two plus that are produced. As we keep turning the photon energy up, it turns back off because now the electron has to, is trying to jump just past that last that next orbital. So we keep turning the energy up further and further and further until the next orbital, the next n number, the next floor in the hotel becomes available. We jump to the third floor, the fourth floor, the fifth floor, and we keep producing photo ions as we turn this energy up. Now this decreases monotonically, linearly like that, because of there's some quantum mechanical probabilities that are going on. As we go to higher energies, more channels open up, so the probabilities decrease. But these things are all the same thing, just jumping to higher energy levels and producing photoions. So really what this is, is it's just like taking an atom, slicing it in cross-section like an onion, and you're looking at all these energy levels. So this is each of these transitions, when an electron jumps from down here to up there or from up there to down there, that is the line that an astronomer sees in either emission or absorption. So we're really giving them the map. So here's one of the plots from another one of the papers from my dissertation. This one is the Selenium Plus paper. So here you can see the direct photoionization background. It's not interesting. We don't care. What we care about are those Rydberg series, those series where an electron is jumping from one orbital to the next, starting in one specific state and ending in another specific state and jumping to an in-between specific state. It's all very detailed. We have 17 different Rydberg series that were identified in this spectrum. Each of these little series of those lines dropping down is lining up with a peak that's showing you it's, it's a process happening in the atom where the electron keeps, keeps jumping to a higher orbital. It's those Rydberg series, those discrete little resonances that the astronomers use as the fingerprint that they need to identify the spectra that they're looking at. Now, another thing interesting about synchrotrons is you have just an enormous blowtorch of photons which means you have enough photons to be able to throw some out that you don't want, which means you can get a really, really small energy resolution. Typically, the photons that come out of a synchrotron, they have sort of a broadband, a big Gaussian. So they have a spread of energies, but to get these accurate photoionization spectra, we need to squeeze that down. We need to throw out all of those slightly too high and slightly too low photons to get this much precision. So you see, this is a lower energy resolution measurement in blue. This is at 24 MeV. And just 10 years ago, we couldn't get any better than that. Now, here's the same spectrum, the same element. This is selenium plus at 6.7 MeV resolution. So you can see when the astronomers are looking and they're seeing these fine lines in here, we're not helping them until we can get to really high resolution. So this really helped revolutionize astronomers' ability to understand their spectra. And in fact, this particular spectra led NIST to shift the reported ionization threshold of selenium plus by almost a full EV. Now you see that and you go, that's 843 MeV. That's a very small amount of energy for those of you who have sort of a relative idea of how much energy that is. If NIST was making maps, that'd be the equivalent of putting Alaska in Scandinavia. It's miles off, 843 MeV off. It's just an extraordinary error that they had published because that was the best data they had at the time. So that's what we're doing. All right, so where do we do this? Well, historically we've been doing it at the advanced light source. That's a beautiful picture of the advanced light source. It's a synchrotron, it's a particle accelerator. It's like CERN, which people have heard of, except it uses electrons instead of protons. It's a beautiful view of the San Francisco Bay. There's the Golden Gate Bridge. There's Alcatraz and I read a disturbing story that great white sharks are now invading Monterey Bay and coming into the San Francisco Bay because of global warming. Yay, global warming. So now there's great whites where all the surfers are. So back to the ALS. The original dome that is the middle of the ALS was built in 1940, and it's where Ernst Lawrence built his cyclotron that he won the Nobel Prize for. It's the same dome there today. If I do my picture, it fades out. You'll see that same dome still in the middle of that image but it's been surrounded by a $100 million synchrotron now. So here's an overview, overhead view map of the ALS. We have electrons whirring around this thing and throwing light off, and we'll talk about how that works. So some facts about the ALS, I love, I always talk about this, that they include how much aluminum foil is used per year. But in this case, the important one I wanna to get to is that those electrons whipping around that synchrotron inside of that storage ring are going really fast, 99.9999996% the speed of light that anyone out there who's had me for modern physics knows I've made you calculate that many times over with their 1.9 giga electron volt electrons. 
So they're whipping around this thing at, at relativistic speeds. And that's going to be important because when we accelerate an electron, when we turn it, it emits photons. I think you saw that with Julie's talk, anyone who attended Julie's talk. So here at the ALS, we have this electron whipping around in a circle. So as it goes around in its circle, it should be constantly emitting photons if it's moving in a circle, because anyone who's at intro physics knows moving in a circle means you're constantly being accelerated. You're constantly changing directions. But that electron actually isn't going in a circle. At the ALS, it's going in a dodecagon, a 12-sided figure. So it's going straight, then taking a bend, and going straight, then taking a bend. Every time it takes a bend, it just kind of throws out photons. Now, those photons have a really broad spectrum, both spatially and in energy. They're not useful for our science. So what we use are something called undulators. And those undulators are on the straight sections. So there's an undulator. That's the undulator at beam line 10. That undulator is just a series of magnets. And what those series of magnets do is they just undulate the electron a very little amount as it's traveling in a straight line. It's being accelerated up and down, up and down, up and down, but very little. And that acceleration still produces photons. Now, if we weren't traveling at relativistic speeds, those photons would go everywhere. So keep that in mind, they would be isotropic. And here's a nice picture of an actual undulator, it's just a bank of magnets that you can separate apart and back together. So that bank of magnets produces our photon beam. Now, it wouldn't be useful if they were going everywhere, but because they're going so fast, there's a relativistic consideration. It's known as the headlight effect. So the headlight effect is as you go faster, these are actually calculations made in Wolfram. As you go faster and the direction of travel is to the right in this, the faster you go, the more your light is propagating in a forward direction. So here we have, I think that's 0.3C, if I remember right. Here's point 0.6c, that's what the light would be emitted from that electron. Let's see an animation of it, where it's 0, 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, that blue thing is showing all of the photons coming out of that thing. The faster we go, the more forward propagating it is. At 99.999996% the speed of light, we have a really nicely forward propagating beam of photons, really tightly collimated. Here's a couple of pictures of students doing work at the ALS that I like to throw in here. This is at the ALS, the Overlook. These are some of the topics we talked about. I'll be talking about this instrument in a minute. I'm not gonna talk about the other, the, the work that isn't related to the astronomy, but there is an entire branch of my work that isn't related, but I'll show you a picture that's associated with it. So here are a bunch of University of Montana students working at the ALS. And yes, they are always having exactly that much fun when we go to the ALS. When it's four in the morning and they've been at the beam line for 16 hours straight, they look just like that, I promise. Now that other project was done with a few other students and that's an X-ray scanning transmission microscope. And I was looking for the energy range of the ALS to prepare this talk and I went to the ALS and I went to their about the ALS page and I scrolled through and I had was not expecting this. I found this page. So I'm going through and there, lo and behold, are Maggie and I in the pamphlet for the ALS, look, linked right to Montana right to Missoula. Yay, go Montana. I didn't even know that existed. I was shocked to find that, that we're being highlighted in the ALS informational brochure available to the world. So yay, Montana. Let's get more people there. Okay, so how do we do what we do? I want to go over the experimental techniques at the ALS. Again, here's that central dome that was built by Lawrence in 1940. Here's the new synchrotron housed around it. The, the old cyclotron is long since gone. There's all kinds of stuff in there now. So here's a schematic of the technique we use, which is called merged beams photoionization. So in this schematic, remember, we start with ions. Here it says we start with a neutral sample, though. Well, we have to ionize something to start with ions. So what we do is we start with a neutral sample in the ECR ion source. An ECR ion source is an electron cyclotron resonance ion source that creates ions by just bombarding a gas with electrons. And that happens inside of a little magnetic bottle. These are all big magnets, these purple and blue things. So inside we have this really excited sea of electrons from microwaves being pumped in there. And then we just leak a gas in, or if it's a solid, we just cook it in an oven and pump it into this thing. So it gets bombarded with electrons. So it produces this soup of ions and electrons inside of the ECR ion source. Here's a picture of the thing. It's inside of a cage because that gold thing is at six kilovolts. You don't want anyone touching that. It's very dangerous. So inside of that cage, we have our ECR ion source, and then we accelerate out all the junk that was made in there. And there's a lot of junk being made in that thing. 
So all of that junk comes out, but we only want to look at one ion. The astronomers want us to look at selenium plus, and then they want us to photoionize it to selenium two plus. So I need to get just selenium plus passing through my system. And I do that with an analyzing magnet. And this analyzing magnet bends the beam around a 60 degree turn. And in doing so, it bends it just for the right charge to mass ratio ion. All the other ions hit the walls. So just the one iron we care about, we can adjust the magnet to pick the one we want. Just the one ion passes through the system. So now the one ion has passed through the system. Now I'm going to merge it. Remember, this is merged beams. We're recreating this stellar atmosphere. We need photons. So the photons come in from the opposite direction. They're counter propagating. They're running into each other head on. So right in here, the two beams are overlapped, which is why it's merged beams. That's really where we're creating that astronomical object. So now we have a second magnet. Now that second magnet's called the demerging magnet. You can notice that primary beam of charged ions of one plus, any of them, if it was one plus, any of them that weren't photo ionized by the photons just bend through the magnet and hit a detector. And we just keep counting those. That's not what we count for our spectra. What we count for our spectra are the things that get ionized to a higher level. So like from selenium one plus to selenium two plus. Two plus is at a higher charge state it goes through this magnet, it experiences a greater force, it turns through a tighter radius, and it goes to our detector. And there's our detector. Right up there, we count the photoions. Here's a little cartoon animation of the business end of this apparatus. So this end of the apparatus is the interaction region where the ion and photon beams overlap. That thing is my demerging magnet, big round magnet. That thing's my detector where I count my photoions, the things that are the product of this process that the astronomers want us to create. And that primary beam Faraday cup is where I just monitor that original ion that I'm studying. Right in here is the interaction region. That's really where we carefully study what's being modeled as these astronomical uh, processes. So my beams winding around from the ECR ion source. Here I have some primary ion beam, for example, selenium three plus. I'm going to photoionize that ion. I'm starting with an ion, and I'm going to hit it with some other or with the photon beam. So the photon beam comes in from the left. The photon beam is now overlapping with those ions. And you'll notice the photon beam is flashing. We'll talk about why that is in a second. Some of those three plus ions will absorb a photon, go through a process, eject an electron, and become four plus. They bend through a greater angle, and they go up to our detector. And those are what we count. That's the entire process. So does anyone have an idea why we flash the photon beam? And we flash it, if you look up here in the drawing, there's a little fan. That's really what it is. It's a little thing, sning, it's chopping the beam. It's literally called the chopper, and it chops the beam. Anyone have an idea what we're doing there? Come on, somebody guess. I know someone out there knows. Uh, yeah, All right, Measuring like the, the background count. Kind of, you're using the off points to use it to see how many background counts happen. That's right. So what's happening here is sometimes ion can be created because the, the ion beam that was coming through collides with residual gas in the instrument and creates a, a four plus ion. Well, that's not a real count. So what we do is any ion that shows up when the photon beam is off is background. Any ion that shows up when the beam is on can be either background or a real count. We subtract the background counts from the real counts in real time just to get rid of the noise in the instrument. So we're only counting real photo ionization processes. So here is a picture of the apparatus. It's a schematic stretched out because I'm gonna fade it out to the actual picture of the apparatus in the background. This is the apparatus that was at beam line 10 at the ALS. There's our demerging magnet. There's the ECR ion source. You can't quite see the analyzing magnet right there. It's the yellow thing hiding there. So this big monstrous instrument was decommissioned in July of 2016 and taken apart. And it was decommissioned because Roger Falcone, who I think, I mean, a lot of my collaborators were very upset with him. I think he was exactly right in what he did. He said, we got to take this thing apart. It's just too big. It takes up too much space in our experimental floor. And this is shared space that we all want to use. The thing is permanently set there. So it's keeping anybody else from doing research on Beamline 10 central branch. And this is the most oversubscribed beamline at the most oversubscribed national research facility in the country. So everybody wants to get on beamline 10 and everybody wants to get the ALS. It turns out that we're hogging all of that room. There are other problems with the thing being permanently mounted on beamline 10. One is 
any given beamline does a tiny fraction of the energies available to a synchrotron. Like for example, beamline 10 could go from 17 to 340 EV, which is the vacuum ultraviolet, a very narrow range. The ALS produces six to 21,000 EV photons at all of its various beamlines. So we're limiting ourselves dramatically by staying at a single beamline. The other thing is, is almost the entire year, the thing just sat there collecting dust. We can only work a couple weeks every few months. We all are students or jobs or whatever we have. We can't be there all the time. So it was a huge waste of resources. So how do you fix this? Well, the idea I came up with was to take that monstrous apparatus and shrink it down to about the size of just that portion of the apparatus so that it can be put on a cart and taken away when you're not using it. So it's not taking up space. It could even be taken back to the university and used in a lab. The problem though is there that's bad. We have to have be travel through all of these various things. And the way that was laid out, that thing was about eight meters long. So my idea was to take that and to do it differently. And what was produced was, and yes, I am going to call this thing M5 and I'm going to have a plaque put on the side. What came out was Macaluso's miniature modular mobile merged beams apparatus. It's a new version of that exact same thing that we had at the ALS, but it's one fifth the size. And the way I did that was first, there were some advances in vacuum technologies. So we could do much smaller pumps and much smaller vacuum chambers. But the other thing I did was I took the apparatus and I flipped it to, so it does a vertical path instead. That's a side view. So instead of winding around the lab horizontally, it starts low, goes vertical, comes back horizontally, then goes vertical to the detector. So that's the new instrument being built currently. And we're almost out of time. I have a bunch more, but I'll just stop coming up at 345. One of the things that really makes this thing so uh, useful is because it's so flexible. The cart can change sizes, it's small, it rolls, and it can go at angles. And the reason for that is we wanna be able to roll it to Here's the four synchrotrons, major synchrotron installations here in uh, North America. I know all there is to know about the advanced light source beam lines. I went to the Canadian light source for a week and surveyed all of their beam lines. Here's an example of what I saw there. I had to figure out how to get the thing inside of an, a radiation hutch because doing x-rays, you cannot be in there with it. So they have to go in these rooms with these heavy do doors. So I had to fit in there somehow. I mean, I had to get it through a 28 inch gap. I only had 2.5 meters in length. So I had to design it around that. Here's another beam line at the Canadian light source, the IBM beam line. I had to get it down this hallway and there's a beam line scientist I was working with with that trying to hide from my camera. There are non-X-ray beam lines that, oh, you don't have a hutch, but look at all this junk everywhere. You still have to make this work. We're there surveying. At, at the ALS, beam line 10, this instrument is now gone and something else is there, so we can't use it. But there's another side branch right here. If you look right there, there's a little port. That's because there's a mirror just up, upstream and there's more photons we can use there. Beam line eight at the advanced light source works as well, but it's really weird. It's got this down sloping beam line that's almost, it's 170 centimeters high. So again, the apparatus has to get higher, go at angles, weave its way around stuff. It's designed for all of that. It's because it can go to various beam lines, it no longer is stuck with that limited energy range. And this is a log log scale, the dramatic energy range. There are some processes that are going on with this thing. I'll fast forward through these and I'll get to questions and we will skip the stuff on theorists, they don't matter. So does anyone have any questions?